notes at this uh, address, or you can just look at my web page and there's a link to this, okay? So, um, yeah. I think for now there's only the notes for lecture one, but I'll upload the ones for lecture two right after uh, uh, this lecture. Oh yeah, so we, I can see myself, so. Um, yeah, so, um, so yesterday we discussed how you can use, uh, you know, a Dirac operator to study interactions between geometry and topology of a manifold. Um, yeah, and we saw that our ideas, like the techniques I were discussing, failed for a very simple example, the example of the torus. Uh, yeah, so today I guess we want to go a little further and study himself instead families of Dirac operators. Um, yeah, so we'll start by talking a little bit about you know, a slightly more abstract way to think about uh, having fam what happens when you have families of Dirac operators and you know, um, even more general families of Fredholm operators. Okay, um, yeah, so I guess uh, let, me, uh, let me recall, so recall, so we have H, uh, I will, you know, there's more general places in which you can look at this, but I'll think about separable Hilbert spaces. Okay, so this is, you know, they're all, they're all the same, but you know, if you want to think about a specific model, you know, you can look at L2 functions on, a, on your manifold. Okay, we always have a nice compact manifold that we look at. And then recall definition, um, you have an operator T, which is bounded, uh, is Fredholm if um, both the dimension of the kernel and the dimension of the co-kernel are finite. Okay, so this is some sense, uh, you know, bounded operators on a Hilbert space are very complicated things usually. But the, the class of Fredholm operator is somehow nicer. Uh, then in, in some sense, they look a little bit like uh, of operators on finite dimensional spaces. And uh, I guess John talked a little bit about this uh, in his class uh, yesterday too. Um, yeah, and we can think about the index of the, the operator. This is defined to be um, the dimension of the kernel minus the dimension of the co-kernel. Uh, an integer. Okay. Um, yeah. Okay. And we denote by uh, Fredholm H, this is the space uh, of all Fredholm operators. Okay. And this is a subset, you know, by definition, these are bounded operators. Uh, so it's a subspace of the set of bounded operators. Uh, so yeah, so let me just tell you two basic properties uh, of these operators. So, so properties. One. Uh, so the space of Fredholm operators uh, inside the subspace, the, the, the space of bounded operators. Uh, is connected, is, sorry, is, uh, is uh, open. Okay, so if you have a Fredholm operator and you change it a little bit in the norm topology, then you still get a Fredholm operator. Okay, um, and then the other thing is that the index uh, from the space of Fredholm operators to the integer is a locally constant. Okay, so not, not, not no. So we know that if you, if you perturb an operator, which is Fredholm, by a little bit within bundle operator, it will still be Fredholm. And furthermore, it will have the same index. So the index is a very robust object to study. Uh, and that's why it's somehow related to topology, because if you perturb a little bit, this index quantity stays the same. Okay, and this is very important because, you know, uh, dimension of kernel and the co-kernel Uh, are not. Okay, so both these quantities, both the number jump uh, when you move a Fredholm operator by a little bit, they stay finite. Um, but yeah, the, their difference stays the same. So that's why Fredholm operators somehow are 
in some sense, very, a very topological object. OK. Um, any question? Um, yeah, so this is a, you know, a crazy space. It's a space of somehow operators on some infinite dimensional space. Uh, but yeah, it turns out to have a, you know, a very interesting uh, um, and describable topology that I'll now tell you a little bit about. Okay, so the, the, the basic tool to study, so you know, we'll look at families of fragment operators, so you can think of it somehow, study the topology of the space. Uh, yeah, so um, the, uh, the, the best tool to, to study the topology of the space is uh, K-theory. So, uh, so, so let me just uh, give a uh, K-theory. Okay, so K-theory is some kind of uh, algebraic topology invariant of a space. Um, yeah, so let's say we, we, we start with X. This is a, a finite CW complex. And for everything I'll say today, I'll think of it as, a, as connected. Okay, but you, know, you can define it also for non-connected, but uh, it's a little more annoying. You have to pick base points and stuff like that. So for, let, let me just say that uh, I'll look at connected. Okay, so, uh, so you know, you, you, later on we'll take um, well, we'll x to be, this, you know, this x will parametrize the family of uh, Fredholm operators. And in the case we look at is uh, the torus associated to to a manifold uh, M. So this is the torus of uh, flat connections on the trivial bundle. Uh, so that's uh, a torus. Um, yeah, and we look uh, at this as our main example. Okay, so we look at, uh, this is uh, vectors, a uh, vector bundle. This is isomorphic classes of vector bundles. on uh, X. Okay, so vector bundles, uh, you have uh, some operations on them. You can di take direct sums, and you can take tensor products. Okay, so this has operations, direct sum, and tensor product. Okay, so this algebraic structure, you know, uh, it, it's very similar to, uh, uh, so this, is, this makes into, may, make, make this into a semi-ring. Okay, so what is a semi-ring? Well, it's the same as a ring. It's just you don't have additive inverses. Okay, so, um, or, or, or multiplicative. Uh, well, you don't have additive inverses. So it's something like N. So I guess the definition of semi-ring is something like N. Okay, so, you, uh, so a ring you can take, you know, uh, you can take, Additive inverses, but in something like N, you cannot take additive inverses. Okay. So in fact, uh, yeah, there is a natural map. You know, uh, this um, from uh, vector bundles. There's a natural semi-ring homomorphism given by the dimension. Okay. So. Okay, so in some sense, uh, you know, we have two nice semi-rings and there's a natural map between them. Uh, but they're somehow different. Let me just, uh, so I guess this is a warning. So uh, N has this very nice property that, you know, uh, that, you know, um, uh, well, that's not, that has a nice property that's not true for uh, the vectors uh, on X. So uh, on vector of X um, is not, Conservative in general. Uh, I.e., you know, the basic thing that we do with natural numbers is that a, if a plus c is the, is the same as b plus c, well, then a is equal to b, but that's not true for vector bundles, okay? Does not imply uh, a equals b. 
okay, so you have to be, that's the only thing that, you know, from a point of view of algebraic structure, this is one big difference between vector bundles and natural numbers, I guess. So that, that has, you have to make things, you have to be a little careful about that. Okay, so, you know, you can think about an example. Uh, for example, yeah, the, the tangent bundle of S2, that is a property like that. <clears throat> oh, sorry, well, I guess, uh, yeah, uh, I, I'll today, I guess, uh, I'll mostly think about complex vector bundles. So I guess that's not an example um, of C vector bundles. Okay. Um, sorry. Okay, so, uh, yeah, so what's, um, yeah, so it, Semi rings are not as nice, you know, we, we don't study them in our basic algebra class because they're not as nice as rings. So if you have a semi ring, it's, it would be nice, you know, we have a semi ring, but it would be nicer to have a ring. And there's a natural way to get one. Uh, so yeah, we have, uh, you know, the, in the same way you get, uh, you know, uh, from n to z. Okay, so if you remember, uh, you know, maybe it's from uh, your um, real analysis class or something that how, how do you define this? Well, uh, Z is defined as some kind of equivalence classes of formal differences of uh, natural numbers. So in particular, uh, in general, we c if you have a simmering S, we can perform the same construction and denote the, uh, this is simmering, and we can denote, get the same, uh, an analogous thing called the Grothendieck ring. Um, okay, and this is the ring uh, consisting of formal differences, A minus B, formal differences. Okay, and you mod out by the relation that uh, A minus B uh, is equivalent to A prime minus B prime if A plus B prime uh, plus E equals um, a prime plus b plus e for some e. Okay, so it, well, I guess uh, if you were, if you do this with n, you don't need this extra e. Uh, but in general, if you want to get a good definition for non-cancellative monoids, sorry, uh, semi-rings, you need to add this uh, extra e in your definition to make things well defined. Okay, so this is a very nice ring. Uh, Okay, so I guess my definition, uh, the, so we have our finite connected CW complex, and by definition, uh, the K-theory of X, uh, uh, this is by definition, this Grothen decree. Okay, so this is a ring associated to your uh, um, um, topological space. Any question? Yeah. Um, no, for some e. Yeah. Okay. Uh, sorry. The question is like, do you need uh, some assumptions on e? And the answer is no. Uh, if there is some e that for that makes it work. Okay. Let me just tell you some. Um, uh, 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 properties. Um, yeah, so, uh, you know, um, an element uh, in K theory is, you know, is a, uh, has the shape, uh, you know, it's an equivalence class. You can think of these, um, them as some kind of formal differences of vector bundles. Okay, up to some equivalence. Um, okay, we had a, a semi-ring homomorphism given by the rank, and you know, it, uh, of this, this construction is very uh, natural, very functorial, so in, in fact you get a homomorphism from k of x to integers uh, given by the rank. Okay, so this is a ring homomorphism. Okay, and finally, you know, this, is, this gives us a functor uh, 
this is a, a functor from CW complexes uh, to rings, uh, I guess. Okay, I guess the, uh, it's a contravariant functor. Uh, in particular, you know, you, if you have a map between CW complexes, there's a map on vector bundles given by pullback, and homotopy, equi no, homotopic map give you the same uh, map uh, on vector bundles. Let me give you isomorphic vector bundle maps. Uh, yeah, so you get uh, a nice, uh, you know, something that looks like homology, okay? Something, uh, a functor to, to rings uh, that, uh, you know, induce map depend only up to homotopy, on your, on your map up to homotopy. Okay, yeah, so th these are just the very basic properties of um, K-theory. And let me tell you, uh, you know, um, a little bit about, uh, uh, I guess this is in the spirit of uh, John's discussion of uh, representability. And K-theory is a representable uh, functor. Um, yes? Uh, oh, yeah, I guess, that, sorry, the, the, the question is like finite CW connected, I guess, sorry, that, that was, this is my working, uh, yeah, finite uh, connected, yeah, yeah, thanks, that, yeah, that's a, I, I might forget to say it at some point today, but that's always the working assumption, yeah. Um, yes, um, yeah, so representability, Okay, so rank k vector bundles. Um, um, these are rank k vector bundles that are represented by the Grassmannian. Okay, so this is the, uh, the k plane uh, Grassmannian. Okay, so this is how you represent the k dimensional vector bundle. Yeah. Uh, what, sorry? What, what? Oh, the question is like what happens if you drop? Um, you know, some things still still are true. I don't know, you, you, you can go at more general, but let's stick with the simplest case for, for, for today. Yeah, I guess, you know, we are, really we only use it for the torus, so you know, that's, uh, that's not, that's not, yeah. I guess, you know, you can go with para compact, I don't know, something like that. Compact, compact Hausdorff or something like that should be, uh, yeah. <clears throat> yeah, okay. Uh, yeah, so actually, you know, a basic fact uh, is like, again, in the set, in this setup we have, if you have a vector bundle, E over X, um, then there exists uh, another vector bundle such that the direct sum uh, is trivial. Okay, so if you think about what this means from the point of view of the definition using the Grothendieck uh, ring, this tells me that any A in K of X uh, has the, um, uh, has, is represented uh, is of the form uh, F minus uh, a trivial bundle. Okay, so you know, in general you need uh, two bundles which are non-trivial, I guess uh, the definition in principle you need two non-trivial bundles, but it, uh, it happens that you can always pick the, the negative one to be uh, um, trivial. Okay, so this, you know, if you think about what this means, uh, you know, uh, it takes a little work, uh, but you can show that this implies that k of x, uh, you know, you have only one bundle here, really, and you know, there's the, the, the dimension here is always well defined, so uh, this turns out to be the same as uh, homotopy classes of maps from x to bu times z. Okay, so bu here is the union of all the uh, Grassmannian. Okay, if you have a k-plane, you know, there's a 
k plus one plane just by adding a new direction. So you can define uh, this, this, this interesting space. Okay, this is the, the, so yeah, this functor kx is representable by this uh, kind of complicated space. Okay. Any question? Yep. Um, yeah, okay, so now let me tell you, so this is one classifying space. Uh, so it, it turns out that, uh, so, so yeah, wh why did I introduce um, um, K-theory? You know, so far this has been a kind of an aside. So we started with fragment operators, right? And so now we, and, and I told you this nice algebraic tool, which is, you know, turns out to be a cohomology theory if you uh, extend it properly. Uh, so, so this is somehow algebraic topology. We're, we're, we're studying some algebraic topology here. But yeah, so the, key, uh, so the key point is the following. So Fredon, ops, uh, versus uh, K theory. The key point is that, so you know, here I gave you a, a, a classifying space for K theory in terms of Grassmannians. Um, but yeah, it turns out that uh, sp the space of Fredon operator is also a classifying space for K theory. Uh, so yeah, uh, so this is the following theorem. Um, okay, so under our assumption, so um, there is a natural bijection. In between, so K theory of X uh, and maps from X to uh, the space of Fredholm operators. Okay, so, the, well, this tells you somehow, you know, the Fredholm operators has the same topology as BU times, this complicated, gross, super complicated Grossmannian. Okay, so, well, the space of, uh, you know, coming from functionality somehow is very closely related to algeb the algebraic topology of your space. Okay, so I guess uh, some, some sense, this is a new, uh, one of these uh, correspondences, I think, you know, on this side you have analysis, and on this side you have uh, algebraic topology, okay? Um, Okay, so in particular, you know, one, one of these is like, so, uh, so in particular, families of um, uh, Fredholm operators on X, uh, parameterized by X, these are in bijection uh, uh, with uh, K theory of X. Okay, so our goal later will be study, to study family of Dirac operators parameterized by some space, the torus, and that gives us naturally an element in the K-theory of the torus, okay? And uh, the, the, it's a one-to-one one correspondence. So our family of Dirac operator will give us an element in the K-theory of the torus. Uh, yes, there's some question? Yeah. Oh, H, sorry, the question is which H? So H, uh, at the beginning I was talking about a separable Hilbert space. They're all the same, so they're all isomorphic as Hilbert spaces, so just pick your favorite, yeah. Like L2 sequences or something like that. Uh, I think. Uh, what, sorry? Mm-hmm, yeah. Yes. Yeah, uh, yes, yeah, so the question is like, well, I have two classifying space, sys, uh, BU times Z and Fredholm. Uh, yeah, so the question is like, is there a relation? Yeah, well, they're, they're homotopy equivalent, yeah. Uh, yeah, so, so the question is like, is the content? Well, it's a little more, you have to be a little careful because, uh, you know, you need to show that this space, you know, it's not a CW complex a priori, so you need to do a little work to show, uh, you, you know, this tells you essentially, you know, the proof will show you that they're weakly homotopy equivalent. 
And then you need to show that something is a CW complex to show that they're actually homotopy equivalent. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, sorry, can you repeat? Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, so, uh, the question is like, how do you see? Now, I'll tell you what, what, this, what this bijection is. That, that we'll need also in our application. So I'll, I'll tell you what this bijection is. Uh -huh. Well, it will be essentially in the, you, you'll see in the construction. Sorry, the question, yeah. So, so no, yeah, let, I'll talk about that now, yeah. Okay. Let, are there other questions while we stare at this beautiful theorem? Well, maybe we just take two seconds to contemplate more? No, sorry. Uh, so the, sorry, what? Oh, the question is like, uh, what uh, is this special, this fact? It's also true for real vector bundles, quaternionic vector bundles. Uh, it's key that the space is uh, compact, though. Uh, yeah, uh, if, if you look at non-finite CW complexes, then this fails. And in general, K-theory is very complicated for non-compact spaces, so that's why we, uh, we'll just look at finite CW complexes, yeah. Uh-huh, any other questions? Yeah, yeah, so sorry, the question is, like, is H complex? Yeah, we'll always work with complex spaces, yeah. Okay, uh, yeah. Um, let's move. Um, yeah, so let me just tell you briefly how, how, to, how, to, how this bijection works. I'll just tell you what the map is. Uh, yeah, so suppose, we have, uh, so suppose we have a family of operators. Uh, okay, so this is a family of operators that goes from H to H. Okay, so uh, th this T is not surjective, but it's almost surjective. You know, the co-kernel is finite dimensional. And because X is compact, implies that we can find uh, a subspace of H, uh, finite dimensional, uh, such that um, the image of Tx uh, plus W, uh, you know, is everything. So we can find a subspace which is transverse to all these uh, Tx's. And that, you know, you can find it locally, and then, you know, just by compactness, then, you, you know, it's not hard to, to find the one that works for all Xs. Okay, so uh, uh, this implies that um, um, if you look at the inverse images of these Xs, uh, this W. Um, well, this is a turns out to be a vector bundle over X. Uh, so this, uh, you know, at each space you have a subspace, and you know it turns out that they move continuously. Uh, so this is a vector bundle. Uh, v. Okay. Um, yeah. So um, yeah. So then you know the map that to a family associates the element K theory sends T x uh, x in x to get sent to uh, V minus the trivial bundle K of x. Okay, so this is a difference of vector bundles. One is given by these crazy uh, pre-images, and, uh, the, and then the other is this fixed vector spaces, uh, you know, the trivial bundle, uh, sorry, dim w. Okay, and this is an element in K-theory. So we, I told you um, how to build a map here, and it takes quite some work to show that it's well-defined and it's a bijection, okay? But uh, yeah, this is, the map is pretty simple. Okay, you just look at pre -image. yeah.
Yeah, that's a, so why are these all the same dimension that follows from friendliness and uh, the index is locally constant? So the dimension of the pre-images will also be, you know, because we're looking at pre-image of a, and they're transverse, the dimension of the pre-images will always be constant. So just a diagram chasing, if you look at it, yeah. Oh yeah. Well, the question, the way the question is like, why is the kernel? Why we cannot take the kernel minus the co-kernel of the t-axis? So the dimension of the kernel co-kernel jump. So you cannot just take the, the. They don't form a vector bundle. So this makes things into a vector bundle. Yeah, but morally that's what you want to do. Like so, just to make things uh, proper, you, you need to do this uh, more complicated construction. Yeah. So this for, this is yeah. Morally, this is just kernel minus co-kernel of this family. Okay, and uh, let me just remark, this will be useful later. So remark, uh, if uh, T of X is a family of isomorphisms. Okay, so if you have a fa family of isomorphisms, you know, you can take, you know, that means the image of TX is everything, so you can pick W to be zero. And then V, you know, it's the inverse image of zero, but that's the kernel, and that's, this is also zero. So, you know, both these things are zero. Okay, so uh, if you have a family of isomorphies, you know, Tx gets sent to zero, K of x. Okay, this will be our, the key observation for our uh, uh, applications. Okay, so under this bijection, a family of isomorphisms gets sent to zero. Oh, sorry? Oh, yeah, so the question is like the ring structure, how do you see them? Uh, yeah, so, um, yeah, you can compose Fredholm operators. That gives you a composition. Uh, but then the sum, you know, the other composition is not as clear, I think. Yeah, so, uh, yeah, that's, uh, you have to, yeah, the composition of Fredholm operators is uh, still Fredholm, uh, but, yeah. Uh, Okay, any other question? Yes, um, yeah, so. Yeah, so K-theory, it, it's, it's very complicated. You know, it's defined, you know, you need to understand vector bundles and, you know, do this Grothendieck ring construction. So it's a pretty complicated space. Um, um, oh no, sorry, before saying that, let me say. Um, yeah, so I guess uh, another remark that I'll put here. Okay, so yesterday we saw that, you know, if you have a manifold M, you get this torus M. Uh, um, this is given by H1 M R mon H1 M two pi Z. Okay, this is the torus of three of flat connections on the trivial U1 bundle. Uh, yeah, and we get a family of Dirac operators parameterized by B in. Uh, so this is the, the chiral Dirac operator um, uh, parameterized by this torus, and these operators go from Okay, and this is a family of Fredholm operators. So you get, these are, this is a family of Fredholm operators. Okay, so this is the, the, all the twisted Dirac operators. Yeah, so this construction gives us an element, um, you know, I guess I didn't say it, but you know, this, uh, this map here, the bijection that goes from here to here, this is, is called the index map. Okay, so, yeah, so I guess the most confusing thing about this, this, this part of math is that uh, everything is called index, uh, and the theorem is that all these indices are the same, okay? So, uh, so I called everything index, and they turn out all to be the same thing. And it's always confusing, oh, is this the, which index is that? Which one are you talking about? But yeah. 
I guess so. But anyways, you get the index of db plus in an element in the k-theory of the torus. Okay, so this is, uh, you know, this is, the, this is essentially captures the whole information, all the information about uh, the topology of this family of Dirac operators by the, the T.I. Yannick theorem. Um, okay, uh, yeah, so I guess now uh, the point I was going to say is that, you know, K-theory, well, just introduced it, but it, it's a very hard uh, object. It, it's very hard to compute uh, in general. Um, it's not like, you know, standard homology, you know, if you have a cellular decomposition, no, it, it's very, uh, you know, you, you can compute it. K-theory is much more complicated to compute. Uh, but yeah, the, the very nice thing is that there's a natural way to go from K-theory to, co to cohomology uh, if, you, if you're allowed to forget some information. Okay, so I guess this is K-theory versus uh, cohomology. Okay, well, so first of all, you know, uh, we have a map K from the K-theory of space, given by the rank, uh, uh, to the, uh, to Z, okay? So, and really this Z, you should think of it as, as the zeroth cohomology of your space, okay? And this, you know, here I'm using that the space is connected, otherwise that's false. Uh, this is H0 of your space. Okay, so X connected. Okay, but in general, you know, there's a much, uh, you know, this, this actually generalizes uh, to a homomorphism called the churn character uh, from K theory of X to uh, the cohomology in even dimensions. So this is the direct sum of all the even dimensional uh, cohomologies of X, but with rational coefficients. Uh, yes? Oh, uh, sorry, well, the question is what are S a plus and minus? So if you remember yesterday we had the spinner bundle S, and it's split in two when the dimension is even, uh, so S plus and S minus, yes. These are the two chiral uh, bundles, yeah. Um, yeah, so this uh, churn character uh, is, a, is a ring homomorphism. And it's defined using, you know, as the name suggests, using churn classes. You know, vector bundle have natural cohomology classes associated to them, which are these churn uh, classes. So let me just write the first few. Uh, so churn character of just an element uh, of a vector bundle is defined by the dimension of E. So here, you see we recover this, uh, the zero dimensional part. And then there's higher terms. So then there's the C1 of E, this lives in H2, this lives in H0, and then the next term is C1 squared minus two C2 over two, and this lives in H4. And then you get a series, which is finite because the, 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 we have a finite CW complex. Okay, so there's a natural way to go from K-theory to cohomology. Yeah, so what's, uh, yeah, in terms of that you don't lose that much information. So I guess the theorem, uh, uh, I guess is that if you, if you uh, tensor, uh, you know, if you rationalize, so K-theory is, is an abelian group, so you can tensor with Q. Um, uh, is an isomorphism. Okay, so K-theory, we define it using this super complicated, you know, much more complicated uh, way using all these vector bundles like Grothendieck rings. But it turns out that if you just look rationally, you don't really get much more information than cohomology. Okay, but you know, as a remark, uh, if you look at the integral version, uh, have very different torsions. 
Okay, so if you want to start, if you, if you, there's actually, it contains different information and cohomology, uh, if you look at integral confusion. Okay, for example, the order of the torsion might be arbitrarily uh, large in, in difference, yeah. Different in the order of. Okay. Uh, any question? Yeah. Uh, sorry, well, what's the, uh, uh, sorry, I, m I missed the question. There were two, uh, what, was it more like two questions, right? Okay. Yes, so that I need two families of different spaces. Yeah, so I guess, yeah, secretly, you know, the key. It, yeah, so the question is like, is there some problems when you look at families and try to identify things because, you know, their, their identification might not uh, give you, be well defined and stuff? Uh, yeah, the, uh, the point is that, uh, and it's a key point behind the proof here that I swept deep under the rug is Kuiper's theorem that tells you that the unitary group of the Hilbert space, infinite dimensional Hilbert space, is uh, contractible. So there's no interesting topology if you look at Hilbert bundles in that sense, yeah. Yeah, thanks. Uh -huh. Is the torsion in K-theory well understood? Well, uh, the question, not by me, some, someone, <laughs> yes, yeah, so, so by someone else maybe, yeah, I guess. Yeah, I don't know what, in which sense. I guess it's torsion in cohomology well understood. That's also, a, I don't know. What, what <laughs> yeah. Anyways. Um, okay. Yeah, so, okay. So this object is, uh, you know, so, yeah, you know, cohomology is a much more friendly object. So we have this element in K-theory, the index of this family. Uh, yeah, so what the Atiyah Singer index theorem, what, what the, the, the index theorem, the Atiyah Singer index theorem for families. Okay, yesterday I gave you the Atiyah Singer index theorem for one element, for one operator, and that's just a number, just the dimensional kernel minus the co kernel, which in some sense, you know, correspond to this this part here, but in general you have the whole information coming from the whole cohomology. Okay, the Atiyah Singer index theorem for families gives a formula for the churn character of the index of db plus. Okay, and this is an element in the cohomology of the torus, even cohomology of these torus of flat connections. Okay, so now cohomology of torus, we, we're, we're, we're happy with that. So it's, a, it's just an exterior algebra, right? So it's a, it's a nice uh, quant, it's a nice thing. Um, okay, so before that, let me, you know, the formula yesterday, you know, the formula for a single operator involved is a hat genus. Then let me remind you, uh, recall, a hat genus of TM. Well, this is an expression in the Pontryagin classes. Yesterday I didn't write it out, but you know, it, it has the form one minus uh, P1 over 24 um, plus seven P1 squared minus uh, four P2 over 500, 760 and plus, you know, it's a, it, you get all all terms in, you know, this is in H0, this is in H4, this is in H8, and so on. You get all the terms. Yeah, so we uh, we need a little bit more of information to write down the actual formula. So, um, 
So yeah, let me, uh, let me so now, uh, you know, the torus, I, I, the torus flat connections uh, is identified with M R mod H1 of uh, uh, M with two pi Z. Okay, so there's a natural identification between, the, you know, this is, you can think of this as a vector space, modular lattice. So the homology of this space is naturally the lattice. Okay, so H1 of EM is Z coefficients. This is identified with H1 with M uh, to pi Z. Okay, and, you know, just for my mental sanity, I'll drop this to pi just by the scale, okay? <clears throat> Yes, so now pick a basis. Uh, so um, x1, uh, x, let's say, you know, let's say our torus has dimension uh, um, m, n, okay, uh, of, um, Z, okay, then this gives, my, gives me a dual basis, y1, yn, of the dual space, okay, and because, you know, the dual, these are identified canonically, this is the dual space of this, and the dual space of h lower one of the torus is just h upper one of the torus. Um, okay, so we have, uh, you know, once you pick, a, once you choose a basis for h one of the manifold, uh, you also get a natural basis uh, for H1 of its torus, the dual basis. Okay, this is a general, general fact. Okay, and then, uh, yeah, we can define the elements. Um, so set omega to be uh, the sum of Psi tensor yi, uh, and this you know this is an element you know the first one lives in h1 of m, z coefficients, uh, tensor h1 of tm coefficients, and this lives by Kunert theorem. This lives in h2 of uh, m times. Okay, yes, so really the index formula uh, will be given in terms of this element here and this element here. And I guess let me just comment, you know, I chose a basis here and gave me a dual basis. Uh, really, and these elements are not to depend on the choice of basis. Okay, I secretly I'm writing the identity in a basis. Uh, but yeah. <clears throat> okay, we're finally ready for the statement of the index theorem. Uh, so theorem, uh, so this is again Atiyah Singer, and this is from 71, so we are moving a little forward in time. So you have an even dimensional spin manifold. Okay, um, then the churn character of the, uh, the index of the family, db plus, um, this is, okay, let me write out uh, something here. So e to the omega times a hat t 
pm. Okay, so what is e to the omega? Well, omega is this thing here. e to the omega is the one thing defined by the power series. So here, uh, so e to the omega is uh, 1 plus omega plus omega squared over 2 factorial plus omega 3 over 3 factorial and so on. Okay, so, you know, th these are, uh, this lives in the even cohomology, so this e to the omega also lives in the even cohomology. So these are even cohomology class, and this is also an even cohomology class. Um, yeah, uh, you know, this lives in the cohomology of this space here. Um, yeah, and then you evaluate it on M. Okay, so this lives in the even cohomology of uh, m times tn with rational coefficients. And then, you know, once you have a class like this, you can evaluate it using Kuhnet theorem, for example, on m, and you get a class in tn. Okay, it's called a slant product, if you want to be more precise. Uh, and, you know, this is an element, so this is in uh, uh, h even of uh, m. So if you do this evaluation, you get an element in uh, H even of Tm, the rational coefficient. Okay, so at least they live in the right, this thing lives in the right object. But yeah, we get this, you know, uh, if we didn't have a family, well then, you know, if you look at that zero dimensional term, which is just the index, you know, you just pick a one, so you just get the A hat genus. So this generalizes the formula that we had yesterday. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, uh, I guess, uh, yeah, you can multiply a class like here. Sorry, the, the, the dot, the question is like that, the dot means cup product. And yes, more or less, you know, this, this, is, a, this is a class in homology of M, and this is a class in the homology of the product, but you can multiply them, yes. Okay, any question? What, oh, sorry? Yeah, uh, the question is like, is, yeah, uh, what is a class of M? Yeah, it's a fundamental class of M. Yes. Um, uh, yeah, the question is like, does it live in a specific grading? Yes, it lives in a specific grading, yeah. Oh, um, yeah, the, there will be, sorry, the, the um, uh, uh, the question is like, yes, where does, where does, where will this live? And yeah, there will be some mixed classes in every dimension. Yeah, so it'll be something, yeah. Yeah, I guess, um, yeah, it will be in a specific grade, but it will have some, some kind of complicated things in, in it, yeah. I guess well, in example we'll see, uh, it, it will be much simpler, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, the question is, why are the coefficients in Q? Uh, well, uh, he, here we have to take the exponential, for example. Uh, yeah, and the term character in general only, is only defined with values in Q, yeah. And the A-hat genus also has uh, Q coefficients, so I think Q is really needed here, yes. Well, sorry, it doesn't depend on? Oh, so, uh, so the question is like, what does it depend on B? Well, here I'm taking all of them. Yeah, I'm taking the whole family. Yeah, if you, if you pick a single B, then yeah, just because Fredholm, the index doesn't change, then yeah, of course it doesn't change with B. Uh, but yeah, that's, uh, uh, yeah, okay. Uh, any other question? Yes. So okay, it's a very complicated formula. I guess uh, <laughs> we don't even we can't even figure out the, the grading of things uh, like just by looking at it. I guess. Um, but yeah, let's look at a very the, you know there's a very nice application to the problem I was mentioning yesterday to matrix of positive scalar curvature on the torus. So let me just, um, so theorem, this is, Romov and Lawson, okay, T, uh, Tn does not admit a metric with scalar curvature positive. Okay, uh, yeah, so I guess uh, the remark uh, can assume uh, an 
even. Okay, if n is odd, uh, otherwise, you know, uh, just take the product with S1. If this has a metric with positive scalar curvature, this also has a metric with positive scalar curvature. So, and it's still a torus, and now we even dimension. <clears throat> okay, so uh, yeah, so last time, uh, let me say, so, uh, so yesterday, so I guess like proof. What we really showed is that if S uh, is positive, then dB plus has trivial kernel and co-kernel for every B. Okay, we show that the index is zero, but the way we show that the index is zero is to show that there's trivial kernel and co-kernel. So this means that dB plus is isomorphism, is an isomorphism. Okay, and by the remark that you know, I left uh, here, if you have a family of isomorphism, well, the, the index is zero. Okay, the index of this family. Um, okay, so in particular also the churn character of this uh, family is zero. Now, to conclude, well, so, so zero is the churn character of the index of the B plus. Okay, but we have a formula now for uh, the churn character of this family. So yeah, first of all, a hat genus of T of the torus, uh, and Sorry, this, is, this would be very complicated. This is the torus of the torus. Okay, so even more next level of complication. Uh, but yeah, the head genus, you know, the head genus is one plus a combination of Podjagin classes. Those are all zero for the torus because, uh, you know, the, the tangent bundle is trivial. So this is just one. Okay, so this tells me by index theorem implies that Zero is this expression here, uh, but now a head genus is just uh, one, so I can forget it. So this is just um, the uh, omega uh, evaluated in a class of n. Okay, and you know, the, the, this is, if you, you need to pick the right dimension, um, and this turns out to be, you know, omega, if n is 2m, the, this is a two-dimensional class, so the, the right thing to evaluate, uh, sorry, uh, no, nothing. Omega to the uh, n divided by n factorial, evaluated on m. Okay. Um, yeah, and this is uh, x1 uh, up to signs. You can compute, and this is plus or minus x1 xm tensor uh, y1 ym uh, evaluated on the fundamental class of Tn. Okay, now x1 were generators were generators of the H1 of, of, the, of M, which is the torus. So this is the dual, you know, in the torus, the product of generators of a basis gives you the dual of the top class. So this turns out to be, you know, Y1, Ym. So this is the, the generators for this other torus. And again, this is a non-zero class, you know, the, if you pick a basis of a torus in H1, their product is the top class in H upper N. So this is not zero. Okay, so really the, the only thing we use really is that the torus has a trivial tangent bundle and the, uh, the, the, pro, the, the, the product of the class, the generators of B1 is a, is a generator of the top class. Okay, so this concludes the proof. Oh, perfect timing.
<laughs> the question is how do you reduce it to T2? I haven't seen that proof before, yeah. <laughs> Anyways, we'll see other applications of the index theorem that don't reduce to T2, I guess. So, yeah. <laughs> yes. Oh, yeah, so the question is like, what's the trick? So if you have a matrix, if you have a knot torus and you have a metric of positive scalar curvature, then you take the product with a standard metric here and that still has positive scalar curvature. Uh, yeah, I guess, uh, yeah, I guess for every, uh, for n, well, I guess n equals one, there's no curvature, I guess, so. Uh, there's no metric. Yes, so if, if, if the circle had a metric of positive scalar curvature, then the torus will also, the two torus will also have a metric of positive scalar curvature, I guess. Oh, yeah, yeah but I think he, he was confused by how the logic, break, if the logic breaks down when n equals 1. And I think it doesn't because the, it's an empty first statement, I guess. If, uh, yeah. <laughs> I guess the question is, like, is there a geometric meaning to this index element? Well, I don't know. I think the, 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 it's somehow measuring how far you can, you know, I guess the, I think the, the most uh, um, understandable meaning to me is that if the index, you know, it somehow measures how far you can homotope things from being isomorphisms at all points. So it gives you obstruction to your family to being a family of isomorphisms. I guess that's the best, I don't know, that's the way I think of it. Okay. So the, uh, the, the, sorry, the question is the homology of TM. So that's always a torus. Uh, so it, it's a, TM is a vector space modulo a lattice. So it's, it's a torus always. So the cohomology is, is just, uh, yeah, the exterior algebra on the, on the, first, on the first cohomology, yeah. Hmm? Oh, yeah. Yeah, so, that, that, so the question is like the, yeah. Uh, so sorry, this is, I, I mentioned yesterday I would lie a lot about the analysis. Uh, yeah, so the, the, the theorems are ex expressed in terms of bounded operators between Hilbert spaces, which are Fredel. Uh, yeah, the Dirac operator is not bounded on L2. It's not even defined on L2. Uh, but yeah, so it's, things work. Yeah, so I, I, won't, I won't open the, the yeah. <laughs> but yeah, it, yeah it, it, for families of elliptic operators, there's a trick to, to, uh, to make into associated canonical um, bounded families, yeah. Uh, are there other interesting manifolds for which this? Uh, yeah, I think it's uh, pretty general. Um, you know, you, you just any manifold with which you can, you know, uh, some combination. So uh, you can get obstruction in terms of the cohomology ring of a manifold and its Pontryagin classes and how they interact. So this is the simplest case in which you know you know the a is the Pontryagin classes are trivial and there's this nice product. 
Uh, but you know, in, in general, you, you get terms here uh, which involves cup products of one-dimensional classes together with Pontryagin classes. So if some of those are, you have some interesting combination of those which turn on zero, then that still, uh, it still tells you that you can conclude, yeah. Yeah, so if you have P1 and a cup of one-dimensional classes, which is interesting that this, this argument might still run. And 